That last scene is actually uh, where Misty won the gold medal in the 100 back. And I can tell you that as a coach, when you have an athlete standing on the top of that podium at the Olympics and they're playing the national anthem, I never listen to the national anthem the same again. It means a lot more to me. You see that video, and if you see a white cap on the Americans, that means they're in prelims. If they're wearing a black cap, that means they're in semifinals and finals. Um, there's a picture there of a young lady sitting in a chair. That's Bria Larson. And uh, she stepped up for her race. And the beep went off without anybody saying, take your marks. And she was the only one that went into the water. So they stood them up, she got out. Clearly flustered, clearly nervous are going crazy at that, at that point. I mean, she's probably thinking to herself, she's DQ'd. They pull her out and say, no, 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 you know, just sit, relax. So, so the referee walks over to her and says, hey, are you ready to go? Bria's never been in that position before. Bria probably should have said, you know what, I need a couple minutes. Can I get a towel? Can I dry off? She didn't say that. She just said, yeah, I'm good to go. Bria didn't make the one team this year. So even at the Olympics, not everything goes right. So when, we, when we're talking to our athletes or our kids, you, you can't talk about perfection. Because I have never, even Missy when she went 204-0 and broke the world record, it was not a perfect swim. There's never been a point that Missy had a swim and I, she got out and I'm like, yep, there's nothing you can fix, good job. Because I'm a coach. And that's the same thing with Bob and Michael. I've had this conversation with Bob a couple times. He's like, ah, oh, there's always things that can be better. So I think that, that sometimes as a, as a coach or as a parent, we just talk about the ideal situation. Gosh darn it, there's no such thing as an ideal situation. Life throws curveballs at us all the time, every single day. And I think sometimes as swim coaches, we're maybe a little more prepared for that because every day is different for us. You just kind of have to roll with it. I tell my coaches that all the time. You just got to roll with it, okay? The more you can think on your feet, the better you're going to be at this job. But I think that's a life skill that we want to teach our athletes also. Is that when something goes wrong, you can't just let yourself collapse and fall apart. Okay, think of any athlete or your kids that you coach, and they the first race out of the meet, it's a bad race. Some of them, man, let's just send them home right then because we know it's not gonna be better. We gotta teach you how to deal with that. And it's one race at a time. Okay, because I don't know anybody besides maybe at the Olympics that only has one race in meet. So we gotta prepare them for that. What happens if this doesn't go the way it needs to be? How are we going to deal with it? How do we move on? Yesterday's story that I told you about missing the 200 free and the 200 back 20 minutes apart. That's a perfect example. She swam an absolutely terrible 200 free and 20 minutes later went out and broke the world record in the 200 short course meter back. Nothing changed because she's not physically fitter in 20 minutes. She was able to leave disappointment behind and move on. That's life. You know, everybody has a story. Everybody's got things going on in their lives. The reality is, is that none of us know what each other's going through. None of us know the experiences that we come to. Sometimes when you get that really bad email from a parent, it might not even be because of that. It might be because they just got a call from a doctor or something, and they're taking it out on you. And they don't mean to, but that's just human nature. 
And I say that because everybody's got a story. And sometimes we forget that. And you need to remember that. And that's why I said yesterday a face-to-face -face meeting is way better than an email. It's way better than a text. It's way better than even a phone call. Sitting down with somebody face to face. Remember what I said yesterday. No one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. That's really life. I'm going to read you something. Anybody know who Bill Sweetnam is? Yeah, Bill Sweetnam uh, has made his rounds. Uh, Bill's kind of an old school guy. Um, he's been in British swimming, Australian swimming. Um, I'm not quite sure where he's at right now. Bill does his rounds. Uh, but about a year ago, one of my coaching friends in Colorado said this to about three of us coaches and just said, hey, I don't usually share stuff like this, but he said, I think this is pretty good. And I read it and I was just like, whoa, that's like spot on. I read this to my coaches every single year. The title of this is, and this is a, it's a swim blog, swimcoachingblog.com. It's actually the, the address if you want to go on it. He hasn't updated it in a while, but he's got some good old posts. Okay, it's called Coaches No Coach. Too many times I've seen a swimming coach standing at the side of the pool, looking over a pool full of swimmers, doing nothing, or talking to no one or staring at their phone, or sitting on deck, drinking a coffee, chatting with another coach or a parent, or even reading the paper. This is the conundrum of coaching. Coaches don't coach. The noun coach is a person, but the verb to coach means to be teaching. If to coach is to teach, then it should follow that to be a coach you mean you need to be a teacher. Doing nothing, however, will read no education, and repetitively doing the same thing, according to Einstein, will read you the same thing. Remember what I said the definition of insanity is. Even if you're expecting something new. I propose that coaches no longer coach at all. They should teach. Somewhere along the line, a group of coaches must have decided that teaching is hard work, so they would just write up a workout and shout motivational word to tidbits to the entire squad. True coaching is engaging and active. It is not in action. Bill Sweetman, the National Performance Director of British Swimming at this time, when I was part of this, his coaching staff in the preparation camp for Athens in 2004, made a series of rules for the coaches. His Moses-like statutes were, you could not turn your back to the pool. You could not use your phone or laptop while on poolside. Any conversations, you must be brief and concise. And if the conversation was important, it should be conducted before or after the pool session. And this last one I don't necessarily agree with. You said you could not drink coffee while on poolside. <laughs> Holding my coffee mug and taking a sip of coffee doesn't prevent me from coaching. I thought he was crazy. And if you know Bill, you would know he is a bit crazy. However, this was logic to his madness. He wanted coaches to teach. With Bill at the helm, if you were not engaged in your pool session and you simply wrote your training session on a whiteboard and then stared blanklessly at endless repeats, you were going to be found out. After the swim session, all the coaches got together in a small room, normally very hot, and Bill, with a devious look that can only be perfected by growing up in rural Australia, would pick out one of the coaches and ask them to tell the group about their session. Every aspect of the workout was picked apart. Every interval query, and you were on show. The green coaches faltered under the spotlight, but it became obvious to me that this was a tremendous learning tool for everyone. Even by faltering, the coaches learn. Painful to watch sometimes, as he picked apart a training session that was obviously designed by someone else, or slapped together without any basis, or even worse, copied out of a sweetened book. But this process, but through this process, everyone learned. 
So the crazy guy was actually a genius. And this guy even says in parentheses, except the copy. The great, the late great swim coach, Dr. Dr. James Councilman, Doc Councilman, wrote his book, Competitive Manual for Coaches and Swimmers, in 1977. Some, some head coaches like to take care of the details and leave the actual coaching swimmers to their assistants, while others just put up the workout and let the swimmers do it on their own. This type of coaching, this type of coach, has certainly misplaced his or her emphasis. For few of his, few of his, his or her swimmers' needs can be fulfilled unless the coach is on the deck. There may be a few exceptions, but I have found that you show me an office coach, and I'll show you a loser. 1977, that was written. For a long time, the teachers of Doc Councilman have been available in the swimming world. They're still prevalent today. Teaching is an action. It is not standing still. A coach must challenge their swimmers and must be intimately aware of the experience that the swimmer is having so that they can react to the situation and adapt the training plan if necessary. For example, if a swimmer was starting to falter on a training set that required target times or pace times, like a race pace set, and nothing was done about it, then the swimmer would begin to adapt to the wrong pace and begin to undo the work that's already been done. Or if the swimmer began to alter the way they power themselves through the water. That, that happens when you get tired. Because they're beginning to get overly fatigued, then the coach must intervene to either change them back to the right stroke, or even stop them, or even have them do something else. Without an awareness of these things happening, a coach would not be coaching. They would be standing on the side, being as useful as a sleeping lifeguard, letting maladaptions take place.